Oh. I hear you've been asking questions. I'm, I'm a journalist. It's kind of my job. Yeah. Well, here at Concrete Shoe and Subaqua Personal Relocation Incorporated, we don't like those kind of questions. People who ask those questions tend to get relocated, if you know what I mean. You, you mean like, uh, sleep with the fishes kind of thing? Yeah, so consider this your only warning. But, I just wanted to know about concrete supercapacitors. Aren't you at least gonna let me go? A little while back, MIT published a paper called Carbon Cement Supercapacitors as a Scalable Bulk Energy Storage Solution. It's an open access paper and we've dropped a link as always in the description. And when we said, hey, do you want us to dig into this potentially foundational material for energy storage, you all were absolutely solid in your approval. I mean, what are we here at the channel about if not to be the cornerstone of your information on concrete. Okay, okay, I promise I'll stop now. Maybe. Bulk energy storage is one of the most significant challenges that, as a society, we face. Fossil fuel gas peaker plants and coal plants have historically provided the bulk of our energy generation needs, and those plants can be combined to provide a steady supply of energy that's roughly adjusted to meet the expected peaks and troughs with the peaker plants spinning up to top up energy demands as required. Those kinds of plants aren't weather dependent. Unless of course you're in Texas where apparently thanks to a lack of regulation power plants and transmission lines don't really work when it's either hot or cold. Which would only really be a problem if Texas was subject to extremes of temperature. But as angsty climate deniers and the fossil fuel lobby are very enthusiastic to point out you can't generate solar in the dark and you can't generate wind power on a still day. I mean you could always do something with hydro or geothermal in that case, but they're not so fond of talking about that for some weird reason. It is also challenging to create a peaker solar plant for your sudden energy generation needs because everyone's popped the kettle on because there's an ad break in uh in Nikki, can, can you give me the name of a popular current TV show? Um, too hot to handle? Isn't that something the humans watch? Yeah, yeah, what, what she said. That's definitely a show that's on TV. So far, we have been seeing a variety of energy storage systems either in use or proposed for working hand in hand with renewable energy generation. So you can store energy while the sun shines or the wind blows or the waves wave. And then you can release it when needed. There's long been the good old standby of pumped hydro storage, which has been around since the early 1900s. Then there's the gradual transition from pilot projects to domestic bidirectional energy transfer from EVs to larger scale grid stabilization projects using a tiny proportion of the energy stored in that large metal object with a giant battery that spends 90% of its time parked outside your house, not moving. It's your car. I'm talking here about using your car for grid-tied energy storage when you're not driving it. And no, it's really not bad for your battery. We chatted to Honda about that way back, uh, back here. Then there's been a raft of pilot energy storage projects, either using recycled or retired EV batteries. We covered those a while back as part of our what happens to the batteries videos. And of course, there's been a massive number of projects as we've seen from Tesla and from a number of other companies building enormous energy storage facilities like Moss Lake, which can generate an incredible three thousand megawatt hours with a peak supply of 750 megawatts. But all of these are either dependent on expensive or complicated to manufacture batteries and require vast swathes of land dedicated to energy storage, along with huge amounts of infrastructure. And the potential for concrete carbon supercapacitors is that they 
don't. They can just be part of our normal house building or renovation processes. For those who are a little unclear on what supercapacitors are, a very brief refresher. If you have batteries, supercapacitors and capacitors on a line with the battery end, you get things that are very high energy density. That is, they can store a lot of energy, but a relatively low power density. That means that while they can hold a lot of energy, they can't give it to you very quickly. Incidentally, energy density can be quoted gravimetrically. That is energy stored per kilo, typically, or volumetrically, so energy stored per unit of volume. So, for example, a litre. If you're building an EV, you typically want both these numbers to be kind of high. For energy storage products, which of these numbers matters depends on what project you're using it for. At the other end of the spectrum, there are capacitors. They have a very high power density, so they can deliver power incredibly quickly, being able to get all their energy out completely in a fraction of a second. That, incidentally, is why it's important to only stick one hand in the back of an old CRT TV. Don't stick your hand in the back of a CRT TV, but that was the advice that my dad gave me about fixing my 1970s Fergie colour star. So while capacitors can get that energy out quickly because of their high power density, they don't actually store lots of energy. They have a low energy density. Supercapacitors, they sit kind of in the middle. They have a higher energy density than traditional dielectric capacitors, but they have a much lower energy density than batteries. On the other hand, they have a much higher power density than batteries, but significantly lower power density than capacitors, which makes them useful for storing a moderate amount of energy that might need to be allowed out quite quickly. Which is good, because traditional home energy storage has been kind of limited. For a long time, a single power wall maxed out at 9.6 kilowatts, although the current version maxes out at 11.5 kilowatts peak, which sounds fine and dandy, until you in your all-electric household plug in your EV to charge, which maxes out that first unit. Then, if you're trying to minimise your grid load and just use your organic, locally sourced electrons, you need a second one to run the actual appliances. Only, you actually probably need more than one, because if you wind up your induction stove for your Thanksgiving dinner, you might be drawing another 10 plus kilowatts there. Toss in your dryer because your kid spilled some black current on your Thanksgiving tablecloth and you've got another 10 kilowatts. And if you've got a tankless electric water heater, you might be pulling another 20 kilowatts on top of that so that auntie can take her quick pre-game shower. Now, suddenly your house is pulling nearly all its power from the grid, which is fine. We love the grid. The grid is a great thing. But in grid planning terms, if everyone starts doing that and you've been relying on folks having a home battery storage system to do some grid stabilization, things might get a little iffy. So at this point, supercapacitors with their levels of okay energy density, but relatively high levels of power density are kind of nice because you can rapidly return that stored energy to meet those very brief spikes of energy demand while storing enough energy to still be useful. So what about MIT? Well, they introduced a relatively small amount of carbon black into cement. Carbon black is formed by burning a carbon-containing substance, wood, for example, although fossil fuel sources have often been used, and burning it without enough oxygen so you get incomplete combustion. Charcoal is a really common example of carbon black that you can just pick up at the store. And carbon black has some interesting properties. It's what's called paracrystalline, which means that, like that pillock who runs around in their combat jacket with an AR-15 at Safeway pretending to be in the military, if you squint at it a bit, carbon black kind of looks like a crystal. Well, bits of it do. It forms little crystalline bits in areas of its structure, but when you look at the whole thing, the structure is clearly not a crystal. Now, carbon black is very conductive, and when mixed with cement and water, the water naturally forms a branching network within the resulting cement structure as it reacts with the cement. And then the carbon kind of wanders into these spaces, making wire-like structures which remain as the cement hardens. These structures look like fractals, incredibly complicated things that have vast surface areas, even within a relatively small volume. Once that whole thing has dried, you soak the resulting material in an electrolyte material, 
in a study they used potassium chloride, which adds the charged particles that you need to make a capacitor. And those charged particles hang out on the carbon structures. Then you separate those two cement carbon blocks with a thin insulating layer, and what you have is a supercapacitor that could form part of the foundations of a building to store energy. In terms of ability to store energy, a roughly 45 cubic meter, that's about 60 cubic yards, block could theoretically store around 10 kilowatt hours, which for much of the world is about the average daily usage for a home. Now, for those of you familiar with supercapacitors, you're probably looking a bit puzzled because that works out at about 0.2 watt hours per liter, which is not good in supercapacitor terms. Typically, you'd expect more in the region of 10 watt hours per liter, although we've seen supercapacitors hit nearly 100 watt hours per liter in the lab. So in terms of performance, no, it's not world beating. In fact, it's kind of terrible, at least in terms of volumetric energy density storage supercapacitor technology today. Yeah. Try saying that 10 times, I barely managed it once. But where it comes into its own is that it's both incredibly cheap and uses nothing hard to get hold of. You can literally use it for the foundations. You don't have to use it in a way that steals space from the living volume of the house. You don't have to take up enormous swathes of land with energy storage. And this technique can be used pretty much everywhere in the world. You don't need anything complicated to make it or mix it. The next tricky thing that you might be wondering, though, is that adding substances to concrete, or in general substances to other materials, affects the strength of the material, which is rather important if you're using it as your building material. Adding carbon black does weaken the concrete, but the authors found that from around 3% to 10% was the sweet spot for not massively impacting the strength, but providing adequate supercapacitor performance. Okay, so this all sounds pretty good. Which is where I get to rain on your parade, though. You remember that I said that you doped the concrete block with potassium chloride? Yeah, so that provides a cycle life of around 10,000 cycles at 95% of the original capacitance, which is pretty spiffy. And after 100,000 cycles, the supercapacitor was dry. Now, I don't know whether you can re-soak it in electrolyte, and functionally how you'd achieve that with your home's foundations is a significant challenge. Because to quote the paper, supercapacitors need to be saturated at all times to ensure long-term stability of the energy storage properties of the electrodes. So that means in very hot, dry climates, it would potentially dry out quicker, which would lead to that loss of capacitance, which would, of course, suck. Also, if you, like me, have enjoyed the charming ambience of your crawl space and its many delightful tenants, you all know that in some parts of the world, like, you know, the Pacific Northwest where we film, that foundation material is often sunk into ground that is wet. And having your carefully manufactured electrolyte get washed into the ground, either by slow leaching into waterlogged ground or by intermittent flooding, will have an impact both on the ground because electrolytes are salts and on your capacitance. So these foundations might need to be externally sealed to prevent that electrolyte escaping or being diluted. And then there's the impact of rebar, the steel that is run through most foundations to give them their strength to cope when the earth moves. And that is obviously conductive because it's steel. And I'm not sure whether that has an impact on the energy density or indeed the utility of the material as a foundation. I did reach out to MIT, but actually I didn't get an answer, which is pretty uncommon. But all those caveats aside, it is great news that this MIT team have come up with cheap, effective supercapacitors using stuff that you mostly just grab off the shelf. And more development could lead the way to another way to help us transition off dirty, planet-destroying fossil fuels. And it supports the transition to clean energy generation. Thanks for joining me today, and if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now, they are some of the more than 1500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure we can be 100% independent.
A huge welcome to our newest supporters, Conrad Young, Neon Frog, Siobhan Graney, Alan Savage, Scotty, Ray Mario, Jennifer Nesesalova, and the Lord of Chaos. Thanks for becoming part of the TE crew. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There's a range of different tiers you can sign up to for as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just under $11 a year. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations, and we even have an old-fashioned PO box that you can reach us at. Address is down below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store also in the down below. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we think this one is also well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving!